Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal one week early and ad-free on Amazon Music or via the Wondery Plus subscription on the Wondery app or Apple Podcasts. From Wondery, I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. And this is British Scandal. So Alice, that's it for the story of the great train robbery. How did you find it? It's sort of perfect for us, isn't it? Because lots of the stories that we cover are British by default, but this is British in its bones. A post office train... A Monopoly board with a prince on it, surviving on tinned fish on a country farm, prison breakouts, being on the run in tropical climes. I mean, it's just got all of the hallmarks of something that we cannot get enough of. No, and the fact that they give the establishment a kicking brings out another British element, which is we're kind of rooting for them because they feel like the underdog. And then on top of that, there is a sense of injustice because they get locked up for 30 years. I mean, 30 years is absolutely crackers. And that sentencing is sort of a symptom of the embarrassment that the British establishment felt. They really outwitted them at every turn. And these men became folk heroes overnight. They were splashed across the papers and not in the way that the police would have wanted. And even when they thought they'd caught them, of course, a couple of them slipped through their fingers and they escaped. It's the perfect sort of last act twist, isn't it? It is. It's a phenomenal story and there's no one better positioned to speak about it than our guest today. Colin McKenzie is a journalist and Fleet Street legend who for decades worked for papers like the Daily Express and the Daily Mail. He was nominated for one of the top 10 scoops of the 20th century when he found Ronnie Biggs in Brazil after he'd escaped prison in the UK. He joins us next. Hi, I'm Sarah Hagee, co-host of Wondery's podcast, Scamfluencers. In our recent two-part series, Three Weddings and a Funeral, we dive into the story of a German conman who built an entire life on fake names, lies, and schemes, and the unlikely true crime twist that brought this decades-long charade crashing down. Listen to Scamfluencers on Amazon Music or wherever you get your podcasts. Colin, welcome to British Scandal. You came into journalism during what you describe as the golden age of Fleet Street. Could you tell us a bit what the environment was like for a young, ambitious journalist? Well, first of all, all the newspapers were congregated in the area of Fleet Street, even if the mirror was in Hoban, but the sun was there, the mail was there, the express was there. So there was a a sort of collegiate atmosphere in the place. We all went out at lunchtime and had two or three hour lunches, getting quite uh, drunk much of the time. Uh, And you had a chance to meet your colleagues from other newspapers, bullshit about stories, boast about this, boast about that. And uh, there was a lot of smoking, a lot of drinking. I didn't actually smoke, which is maybe why I'm still around to tell the story. It was a lot of fun. Was it a very competitive atmosphere? Enormously competitive. Circulations were sky high in those days. The mirror sold over five million copies. The Express was hovering around four million copies when I did my big scoop. Of course, the Sun, it wasn't until Murdoch bought it in 69 that it suddenly became the new giant of Fleet Street. The Mail was a sort of middle range, middle circulation paper. Uh, The Telegraph and the Times, they were all doing well. And people took newspapers as a matter of course. Everybody bought a newspaper. These days, of course, they get their information in other ways. And the Largest selling newspaper is my old paper, the Daily Mail now. Lucky if it sells 900,000 copies a day. We couldn't have you on for more than a few minutes, Colin, without asking you about the Great Train robbery. Do you remember first hearing about it? Well, I was actually, uh, although I'm very ancient, still a student at Oxford in 1963. So I can't even remember if I was actually in the country when it happened. I've got a feeling I was on my long vacation in America that year. So it didn't resonate with me at the time, particularly. And when I got into Fleet Street a year later, I obviously was aware of it, but not particularly aware of it because I hadn't seen the enormous coverage it got in 1963. But of course, over the years, it it became a sort of legendary crime and achieved a fame out of all proportion to what happened, really. 
Well, when you talk about legend and fame, the one name synonymous with the robbery is Ronnie Biggs. But we've been shocked, really, uncovering this story that he actually played quite a small role in the robbery itself. So what was his impression of his own role in the robbery? Oh, he was quite modest about it. And indeed, uh, to misquote Winston Churchill, he had much to be modest about. His sole role in the great train robbery, apart from being a bit of the muscle, was to recruit a retired British Rail driver who could take the place of driver Mills and take the train engine a further mile down from when it had been stopped. And unfortunately, Biggs's man wasn't up to date with the new diesels, didn't know how to get the pressure up again. And that's why driver Mills was coshed and forced to drive the train that extra mile. So Biggs's role was really little more than the T-boy, a bit of muscle and providing the driver and he more or less failed on all three counts. And of course, he subsequently became famous because he escaped from prison, was on the run for nine and a half years. And um, great Amazon forests have been hewn to describe uh, his life on the run. And he has become by far the most well-known name connected with the train robbery. But in actual fact, his role was quite small. Yes, kind of remarkable that he became the poster boy, really, isn't it? Um how did the establishment react to the news of the robbery? Well, as you might imagine, uh, there was shock at the amount of money, shock at the audacity of the raid on Her Majesty's mail train. The death penalty was about to be abolished, but this led the establishment in the form of judges and parliamentarians to take the view that anything of this nature, of a conspiracy, to interrupt uh, Her Majesty's mail train and that sort of thing should be penalised even beyond the uh, crime of murder. And when they got 30 years apiece, the ones who were found guilty in the initial trial, um, they turned to each other and said, we'd have got less for murder. And they were right. We recently covered the Profumo affair on this show. Can you give us a bit of context as to how that influenced the reaction? Well, I don't think the Profumo story of itself influenced uh, how the train robbers were treated. But of course, that happened about two months before the great train robbery. And the Conservative government of the time, which was highly embarrassed by Mr. Profumo, decided that it would be a very good idea if the front pages were full of other matters. And other matters, such as a great train robbery and a conspiracy to deprive Her Majesty of 2.6 2.6 million pounds worth of used notes almost fell into their lap and the Profumo uh, inquiry and the Profumo story took a back seat once the grain train robbery came along. So it wasn't so much that this was another scandal that rocked the government. This was actually a convenient distraction for them. I think you're right. I think it was a convenient distraction and it uh, was quite a convenient way of getting Profumo off the front pages. And the robbery has been referred to as the first mass media crime. What part do you think the media played in fueling the pressure on the police and the government to act quickly? Well, of course, it was considered an enormous crime. It was given a sort of Robin Hood status by the media to some extent. And I think even the train robbers were astonished that there was quite so much money on the train. But they got a man up in Carlisle called the Ulsterman who tipped them off about the money going after a bank holiday down from Glasgow and Carlisle down to London. And he was the man who said, don't go on August the 7th, which was the original date planned. He said, delay a day and there'll be more money. And even they were astonished that it was over 2.6 million pounds. And to put that in context, of course, 2.6 million pounds in 1963 would be nearly 100 million today. It's a nice payday. Very nice payday. And It was Biggs' birthday as it happened on August the 8th, and he started lighting cigarettes using 10 shilling notes, which, of course, was outrageous in a way, but rather typical of Biggs, who was quite a comedian. Uh, And 10 shilling notes were considered almost valueless compared with the pound and fibres that they got in the raid. Much better than two pounds stuck in a birthday card. That is fantastic. (laughs) Exactly. Another facet of this story that we found really striking is the way in which the public reacted to the robbery. Do you think there was an element of enjoyment in watching the police fail to catch these robbers? Oh, I think that's undoubtedly the case. Um, Until later on, the level of violence 
wasn't really mentioned a great deal, although Driver Mills was coshed. Uh, he was um, able to get up and drive the train again. He had 14 stitches, but his injuries were largely caused by banging his head on iron protuberance in the cabin. I'm not excusing the robbers in the slightest. He was undoubtedly coshed. But I think there was an element of this Robin Hood syndrome, and the public thought it was a great hoot that these uh, villains had got away with 2.6 million pounds, which indeed was going down to be burned in a uh, factory in Essex, which actually was used to burn um, old news notes. When speaking to Ronnie Biggs, did you get a sense of why he decided to escape from prison? Well, it was the length of the sentence, of course, that did it. All of the original robbers uh, got 30 years. Some of the ones who were caught later, like Bruce Reynolds, only got 18 years because it was three or four years later, by which time the establishment's disapproval had uh, waned a little bit. And uh, it was, I think, generally considered that 30 years was excessive for a robbery. But the motivating factor was that they were all held in solitary for much of the time. Biggs had to wear a special yellow jacket so that it made it even more difficult for him to be anonymous in prison. And um, I think the thought of having to, to do 30 years really turned his mind and, uh, and that of his family. Of course, his wife very much assisted in this process. And, and it wasn't until after he was on the run several years later that the parole system came in and he would have only had to do maybe 10 years. He said he could have faced that, but he couldn't face a minimum 20 to 25 years. Hi, I'm Lindsey Graham, the host of Wondery's podcast, American Scandal. We bring to life some of the biggest controversies in U.S. history, presidential lies, environmental disasters, and corporate fraud. In our newest series, we look at a covert U.S. operation that toppled a democratic government in Iran. In 1951, Mohammad Mossadegh was elected Iran's prime minister. Mossadegh was largely focused on strengthening his country's democratic institutions. But he also sought to nationalize Iran's oil industry, letting his country's citizens profit from their own natural resources. But as Mossadegh carried out his sweeping reforms, U.S. officials grew concerned that Iran would soon fall under the sway of communists. And with the blessing of America's top political leaders, the CIA launched a mission to oust Mossadegh from power. The campaign involved bribes, psychological warfare, and staged riots. And it all led to a showdown that promised to reshape the Middle East for decades. Follow American Scandal wherever you get your podcasts. And you can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. He was on the run for an incredible nine years. How did you first hear about his whereabouts? Well, he was. He was living in Australia initially. Uh, and then Charmian and his two boys came out to join him out there. And they had a third son, Farley while they were living in Australia. But he'd ended up being a carpenter working for one of the Murdoch TV channels in Melbourne and had a settled, almost sort of middle-class life in Dandenong. <clears throat> and suddenly there was more pictures in magazines. I think after Reynolds had given himself up at the end of 69. Um, and uh, this led one or two of the neighbours to thinking that the man who lived down the road in Dandenong could be Ronnie Biggs. And he, he then went on the run again in Australia for two or three months before getting a passage uh, to Panama. And he then wandered down through South America and ended up in Rio de Janeiro, um, which had two advantages. One, it had plenty of pretty girls that he could uh, woo. And the other one was there was no extradition arrangement between Brazil and Britain. Uh, and that's where he was when he came into my life. Now, some of the great scoops in press history are, are down to hard work uh, and real diligence. I have to say my scoop was a bit of sheer luck. My dad lived in Brazil and he was over on leave in the uh, December of 1973. And I invited the neighbours in um, the street in Battersea where I lived uh, to come to a party to welcome him back to England. And um, one of the guests was a young 19-year-old student who had been backpacking around South America. And uh, when he learned that I was a journalist on the Daily Express, he sort of said, oh my goodness, I bumped into somebody you'd love to meet. And before he could finish the sentence, I said, you bumped into Ronnie Biggs, didn't you? 
And he went absolutely crimson. <laughs> and I knew I'd hit the nail on the head. And I said, Constantine, we're going to go and have a nice pub drink tomorrow. <laughs> and, and I'll see where we go. And that's literally how I found out about Biggs. And extraordinarily enough, Biggs had asked Conti four months earlier to find a newspaper uh, who would pay some money to his wife, Charmin, in Australia in order for him to give himself up and come back to Britain, do his time, because he now knew that he wouldn't be any more than 10 years. And uh, if Conti could do that, he would give himself up. And that was the original plan until Scotland Yard got involved. Yeah, life on the run obviously just sounds very, very stressful, but it can also look very glamorous. And if you've got a lot of disposable income and you're in beautiful tropical locations, it can look like the perfect life. But do you think for Biggs and for other people like him who end up on the run, there's a part of them actually that always yearns to come home, even if it means facing arrest? Yes. I mean, different train robbers had different... Uh, Buster Edwards, for example, had been living in Mexico and his wife was living in Mexico and they just yearned to come home. They were out of their comfort zone. I think the same thing happened with Bruce Reynolds. I think in Biggs's case, it wasn't the urge to come home so much as the fact that he never had any of the train robbery money when he left. It was all used up by the costs of getting him out of Wandsworth Prison. He had a very expensive plastic surgery in Paris on his way down to Australia. Some bent solicitors used his money thinking they'd never see him again. Uh, and so he was always skint when he was in um, Brazil. And uh, the stress of that and the fact that if you didn't have papers, you'd be stopped any minute by the local police and asked for your passport. And his passport was out of date. He had no money. He was doing odd jobs for expats uh, as a carpenter and general builder. But it, it was getting very, very stressful. I mean, he didn't mind being there because of all the beautiful girls he was seducing every other day. He was quite a good looking chap, six foot one, blue eyes, and knew how to chat to people. And he had the wit and intelligence to learn Portuguese, which I don't think many of his great train robbery colleagues would have been able to do. So that set him aside slightly. So I don't think he was motivated by love of Britain so much as the thought that he could uh, stop having to look over his shoulder all the time, be stressed out in that respect and could do his time and then go to Australia and reunite with his wife. So what happened once you had that tip-off? After I debriefed Constantine, who admitted it was Biggs and all the rest of it, uh, first of all, Biggs hadn't paid his phone bill, so we had to arrange for him to go to a, another girlfriend's house who had a phone that Constantine had the number of, and I got him about a day or two later on the phone. I cross-examined him, having gone through the cuttings, in the Express Library, um, as far as I could take it. And I was pretty convinced uh, that it was him. But I said, would he be kind enough to send his uh, fingerprints? Because the Daily Express had a fingerprints of all the great train robbers, and we could be sure it was him. And he said, no problem, mate. So he literally found a card with an old-fashioned train on it, put his dabs on it, and... Um, said, hang on a minute, I've got my book here, I'll say what he said, he got a great sense of humour. Yes, here it is. Hi Colin, perhaps not the best set that have been taken, but certainly as good as those found on the Monopoly box and the sauce bottle. Convinced R.A. Biggs. That's incredible. Uh, and there's a picture of a, a little portrait of an old fashioned train puffing along. So um, I then did another interview with him, which was in the Daily Express at the behest of the editor and news editor, went over the same question I asked him, but he was very patient and answered them all. Colin, why do you think he told his story to you? Why did he want to speak? Well, he wanted to speak because he wanted to get some money for Charmian, and he wanted to give himself up in an orderly fashion. He felt if he gave himself up, rather than being arrested by Scotland Yard, it would count well for him. Uh, and in other words, he'd already done a year and a half in prison. He would only have to do another eight and a half years. The Daily Express, through me, had promised him uh, and his wife £35,000. They weren't going to pay Biggs, but they would have paid um, Charmian that money. They never did, I have to say, and I bitterly regret that. And for that reason, I did give Biggs a large chunk of the royalties of my the book I did on him in 1975. Everyone on Fleet Street must have wanted the story. Could you believe it landed on your desk? 
No, it's pure luck. <laughs> I'm not claiming any great skill. As one of my colleagues said to me, there's an awful lot of copy in Brazil, which was a play on them. You're probably too young to remember the, the Bob Hope and Bing Crosby song. There's an awful lot of coffee in Brazil. <laughs> well, this was a play on those words. It was a major jaunt for a lot of people, a lot of stress, a lot of competition. The other papers hated the fact that Daily Express had got this story. And the story quickly became a source of contention in the Daily Express offices. Why did your editor end up getting so heavily involved? Well, I had to tell the editor about the story because he had to finance me going out there. And um, we were so nervous about the news of the story getting out, I actually literally walked up Regent Street into a travel agent's with four and a half thousand pounds. That's two years salary in those days to buy first class tickets to go to Rio. The editor of the Express, whose name was Ian McCall, had come down from Scotland a year earlier. He was editor of the Scottish Daily Express and he was a little inexperienced and unworldly. And the Daily Express had printed a story four months before my big story that we had found one of the great Nazis, uh, Martin Bormann in Buenos Aires. And we'd uh, bought the rights to a book which claimed he was there. We'd sent uh, a reporter and photographer down from New York. We'd spent six months on the story in Buenos Aires, which we then published. And a picture of Martin Bormann crossing a street in Buenos Aires. It turned out that the man in the picture was a perfectly innocent Buenos Aires school teacher. All the companies we said that Martin Bormann was a director of they all sued, and it was an extremely expensive and frustrating time for the editor. And I imagine he very nearly got sacked because it was such an error of judgment to pursue that story. Well, when I march in four months later and say I found Ronnie Biggs in Brazil, all he can see is pound signs going over the horizon. And unbeknownst to me, the editor I had gone to a boxing match just before Christmas, sat next to the deputy commissioner of Metropolitan Police, and uh, he probably had one too many glasses of champagne, I don't know, but thought he'd involve the yard as a bit of insurance and said, would you like to know that one of my young reporters thinks he's found the Ronnie Biggs in Brazil? Well, of course, the police weren't going to turn that down. And from then on, I was a marked man and my phone was tapped and God knows what. But it wasn't until right at the end, I was made aware that the police were going to follow me out to Brazil. I was absolutely shocked beyond belief. Uh, none of us could believe this had happened and that the editor had behaved in this way. So I felt I was letting Biggs down, big time, and um, I, I couldn't see where, how it was going to end happily. So did you feel that inadvertently you'd stitched him up? Absolutely. I mean, uh, if you read my recent memoir, Pressing My Luck, I begin the whole book by saying about the stress and tension of knowing that he was about to be arrested and trying to carry on as normal interviewing him, you know, it nearly gave me a heart attack. Did the police tell you in no uncertain terms that you had to comply and assist in this operation? Otherwise, there would have been serious repercussions. They did. I was threatened the whole time. I wouldn't give them his address, for example, when I was informed. I had to go down to uh, the Daily Express lawyer's flat in Olympia where I briefly met Detective Chief Superintendent Slipper and the Commissioner of Police. Uh, and I, I refused to give the Biggs' address, but they did, of course, know he was in Rio because uh, they had the tape of my phone conversation with him, which uh, the Daily Express had been taped. So I, I, I was in a very difficult position, trying to save the story as a great scoop, trying to be honourable with Biggs and trying to be honourable with my own conscience. You've painted a picture of a very charismatic, charming man. When did you first meet Ronnie Biggs and what was your first impression of him? Well, I met him literally three days before Scotland Yard arrested us in mid-interview. So right at the end of January 74, my first impression he was very tanned, blue-eyed, and spoke well, but with a rather high-pitched South London accent, which I wasn't connecting with a sort of villainous character. <laughs> and he was very charming, quite well read. He'd done enough time in prison to invade the prison libraries, and uh, he was no fool. And um, he was happy to spend what he thought was going to be a couple of weeks of wining and dining in Rio's finest restaurants before giving himself up. What he wanted to do 
He's going to have his picture taken next door to the Corcovado, the Christ Redeemer on top of Rio, uh, up the Sugarloaf Mountain, the various houses he had been a carpenter at. So we spent a day and a half doing all the scene setting with my photographer, who was a brilliant, brilliant photographer. Um, and when every time I sort of said, well, what happened now, Ronnie? He would say, tranquilo, Colin, tranquilo, we've got all the time in the world. Because I couldn't tell him we had no time in the world because British Scotland Yard was coming along. Was there any part of you that wanted to tip him off? There was. We did think of uh, spiriting him away into the interior of Brazil. I mean, my dad lived up in uh, near Mato Grosso. He was a, a farm manager and I had decided we would contact my father over the weekend to see if it was possible to get Biggs safely away into the interior of Brazil. But of course, that was taken out of our hands when he was arrested on the Friday. But you genuinely thought about doing that? We, oh, we genuinely thought about it, spiriting Biggs away. But in, in fact, in fact, I'm afraid events overtook us. We just didn't have the time to do it. And every time you lifted the phone in Brazil, you had to wait four hours to get a connection. To even ring my father in interior Brazil would have taken hours and uh, to, to, to lump this on him with, with no knowledge. He had no idea what I, that I was there even. Uh, until a few days. You'd have had to have been on the run too, Colin. (laughs) Well, it did cross my mind, but unfortunately things progressed without my knowledge to such an extent that there was nothing we could do. So tell us about the day of the interview and how it unfolds. Well, it was about the third day I was actually with Biggs. He'd come up to Constantine's bedroom in the Trocadero Hotel. Bill Lovelace, my photographer, had been given an instruction by the police to open the window of room 909 and lean out with his camera as a sign for Detective Chief Superintendent Slipper and his sergeant to come up uh, to the ninth floor and burst into our room. Police were already outside the hotel, watched him go up in the lift with Lucia, his girlfriend, up to the ninth floor. Bill Lovelace gets the window open, gets outside, and they know he's there in situ. They actually took over 15 minutes because the lift went wrong and Slipper was very nervous and sweaty. Um, But they eventually knocked on our door. I, of course, was aware of what was going to happen, but I've had to try to stay normal and focused on the story. Um, My heart was beating 190 to the minute, as you can imagine. And then Slipper and Sergeant Jones went through the process of arresting Biggs. He took Biggs into the bathroom in this room and tried to put handcuffs on him. And Biggs said, I'll come quietly. Don't put handcuffs on me. I can't stand them. And Slipper said, all right, mate. Well, he grabbed his shoulder and said, you're not going anywhere. And Biggs said, all right, I'm not going anywhere, but don't put handcuffs on me. And I'm just in a state of total shock the whole time, really. But I'm on auto cue, and I just carry on trying to do things. Bill managed to get downstairs onto the street level and got this uh, iconic picture of Biggs being held by Slipper as he was put in the back of the British consul's Morris Marina, can you believe, uh, and driven off to the um, local prison. In that moment, does Biggs realise that you're complicit and do you have to play dumb so that he doesn't? No, he didn't realise we were complicit until two or three weeks later when he started reading other British newspapers who more or less spelt out the fact they expressly cooperated with the Yard. So then I was a dead duck. What happened to Biggs after his arrest? He was taken, interviewed for three or four days, and then taken up to the foreigner's prison in Brasilia for three months while his case was processed. I, meantime, got hold of a Brazilian lawyer for him, spent 4,000 US dollars of my own money to take on his case. And by the time the three months was up, his original girlfriend, Raimunda, had come back from visiting her parents in the north of Brazil, discovered she was pregnant. That was another um, well, a good scoop along the way that I got. And as the father of a Brazilian child, the Brazilians decided that he had to stay and be responsible for this child financially in every other way. And uh, they refused to allow his extradition to Britain. Thinking back to that time, What impact did the story have on your career? How did the rest of Fleet Street react to the way the story played out? Well, when I went back to Fleet Street after doing this story for about three or four weeks, there wasn't the normal sort of hero grams going around. The editor was deeply 
shifty and odd about the whole business. All the other papers thought I'd betrayed Biggs and given him to the police. They didn't seem to realise it was done above my head by the editor. Um, the Scotland Yard issued a press release which was deeply unhelpful to me, which said that Scotland Yard and the, in conjunction with the Daily Express have located Ronnie Biggs, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I'm afraid it rebounded on me. And did you ever speak to Ronnie Biggs again? Oh, yes, I did. I took the book out to him the following year when it was published. We did have a bit of a falling out because uh, I had always kept quiet the fact that I was aware of the police involvement briefly before we met. I probably should have told him, but I didn't. I was trying to save the story and then at the same time trying to save his skin. And it was because the arrest was brought forward at the last minute. It was brought forward. We were supposed to be given four or five days and we were in the end only given two and a half days, all for circulation reasons. They wanted the story to come out on a Saturday morning. It was given to ITN on the Friday night that we'd found Ronnie Biggs as a method of boosting circulation to God knows what, about six million, I think it was. So I only literally had a day and a half to two days with him. And as I mentioned earlier, he was thinking he was going to have at least two weeks to tell his stories. All he was doing was posing for pictures during that one and a half day. So I was very unhappy that I got stabbed in the back for the second time by the story being brought forward. And did you and Biggs make up? Did he see your point of view? He always had a bit of suspicion about me after that. I mean, uh, another book came out which did the whole background story to the Fleet Street sort of circus that went on around the thing. And he did reveal in his book, which Biggs had seen by a year later, uh, that I did know in advance uh, of the police involvement. And so he was very wary of me after that. It was a shame, really. But uh, I was still able to help him financially. This story never goes away, Colin. It's constantly repackaged and retold. Why do you think it is that it continues to captivate people? Well, uh, I can't honestly answer that, except that there's a generational thing, I think. Anybody under 50 doesn't even really know who Ronnie Biggs was or who the great tra- what the Great Train Robbery was, oddly enough. We're trying to change that, Colin. <laughs> We're trying to do our bit. <laughs> well, I'm very grateful. So it is all a bit historic. Do you think there's something in the British psyche that just loves a caper? They love the kind of mythology and the legend around this kind of story. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I've just watched Gold, yes. which, uh, of course, is about the Brinks Matt robbery. Uh, and um, funnily enough, I'm very great friends. I play squash with a policeman who was one of the eight flying squad people on that caper. And he was hopping mad about how they were portrayed as rather glamorous figures. But I, I think there's no question crime is, I mean, you only have to look at uh, what's on television at the moment and fictional crime every other week. They are great sources of entertainment for the public, aren't they? Is there a danger with this, though, that we say, actually, these guys are all right. It's a victimless crime. You know, obviously, the train driver got coshed, but also the money belonged to the public. That meant that there was less money to go on, say, schools, hospitals, police, keeping society safe, that crimes like this actually aren't victimless and treating them like they are, in effect, is distorting history. Uh, Well, I entirely agree with you. Uh, They're definitely not victimless, although this money was going to be burned, taken out of circulation, but nevertheless... It caused inflation because there was two and a half million extra money going around that shouldn't have been. It was very important. I'm going to say something slightly controversial. It was very important to the case against the robbers that Jack Mills, the driver, was seen to be badly injured because they could then claim this was an armed robbery. But I have to tell you, when I was doing my original book, I found the coroner's report from Mr. Mills's death. And the death was, and I'm quoting, due to bronchial pneumonia, chronic bronchitis and chronic lymphatic leukemia. I am aware that Mr. Mills sustained a head injury during the course of the Great Train Robbery in 1963. In my opinion, there is nothing to connect this incident with the cause of his death. Well, that got awfully little coverage at the time. There's no question the train robbers got 30 years because of uh, driver Mills's injuries. The coroner said, no, they didn't cause his death. That was quite interesting, I thought. 
Absolutely, yeah. And we understand that there was actually a an increase in armed robberies after the Great Train robbery because the sentences were so high that there was no incentive to go into those robberies without weapons. Well, that's the, that's true. And of course, one of the train robbers' great gripes is the fact that they decided not to take guns or anything else uh, other than a couple of coshes onto the Great Train robbery. And as they said afterwards, well, we'd have got less for murder. For myself, you know, you can't excuse crimes like that or the Brinks Matt robbery. I think they're disgraceful. But they have acquired not only notoriety, but a certain glamour. They have indeed. Colin, thank you so much for giving us your insight and bringing this story to life. It's, it's been a real treat. Good. I'm <laughs> glad you've learned something anyway. We certainly have. Thank you. You can buy Colin's memoir, Pressing My Look, from all bookshops. Now, Alice, you're in charge next week. What have you got for me? Yes, I am gladly taking the wheel. And Matt, all I ask of you is that you grab your trench coat and your trilby, which I know that you have and love to wear on occasion, because we're diving back into the murky world of espionage. Oh, amazing. Can I still wear my trainers? Yeah, go on then. It's a story of deception, betrayal and dangerous double agents in the highest levels of British society. We're telling the story of the Cambridge spy ring. Brilliant. This is the fourth and final episode in our series, The Great Train Robbery. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all of our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read The Great Train Robbery, Crime of the Century by Nick Russell Pavia and Stuart Richards, and The Autobiography of a Thief by Bruce Reynolds. I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. British Scandal is produced by Samizdat Audio. Our producer is Millie Chu. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our executive producers are Theodora Leloudis, Stephanie Jens and Marshall Louis for Wondering. Hello, Prime members. You can listen to British Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey.